Hello, my name is Dr. Hart Pinto, and today we're going to be looking at post-operative complications, and this is part of our surgical emergency lecture series. In the first part of this lecture, we're going to look at the definition of post-operative complications, post-operative hemorrhage, surgical wound infections, wound dehiscence, anastomotic leaks, and post-operative pyrexia. Okay, post-operative complications are typically classified in accordance with their time of presentation from the original surgery. Immediate complications usually occur within the first 24 hours of surgery. Early occur as an inpatient or within 30 days of the procedure and late occur following discharge or greater than 30 days following the initial procedure. Our first topic is going to be post-operative haemorrhage. Its presentation can be divided into three sections. Primary, where the bleeding occurs during the operation and usually can be controlled before the end of the operation. And this is due to incomplete hemostasis of the blood vessels. There's reactionary, where the bleeding occurs within the 24 hours following the operation and is usually due to the blood pressure increasing post-operatively as the anaesthetic agents start to wear off which may dislodge clots and cause bleeding. The secondary bleeds can occur up to 10 days following the operation and are typically associated with an infection at the site. Okay, so we've got a patient who's post-operative and we think they're bleeding. What do we usually see? Patients typically complain of lightheadedness, episodes of blackouts, they may feel more lethargic as their blood count decreases. Patients may even become more confused or even agitated as cerebral perfusion is impaired. So when we examine our patient, what do we see? They may demonstrate signs of shock, they may be tachycardic, hypotensive, and they may be breathing rather fast in response to their significant blood loss. We may observe that the patient has become rather pale. We may observe blood staining of their dressings. And when we go to observe our patient's drain outputs, we might observe a high output of frank blood and not the serous fluid that we usually observe from our surgical drains. Okay, we have an unstable patient and we know they're bleeding. What do we do? The first thing to do is to put direct pressure onto the bleeding site in order to try to reduce any superficial ooze. It's imperative to make sure that patients have good IV access and that we can give up to a stat one litre of crystalloid if there is any sign of shock. We must contact the transfusion laboratory and request urgent cross-match of blood. We may potentially use rhesus O negative blood if patients are very unstable or an extremis. If we know patients have been on warfarin or have known coagulopathies, it may be worthwhile considering giving vitamin K or fresh frozen plasma. If patients aren't already, we want to make sure that they are catheterized so we can accurately monitor their urine output. And of course, we want to withhold any anticoagulants. We certainly don't want to make them any worse than they already are. Patients typically come in two groups, those who are hemodynamically stable and those who aren't. When we find that a patient is hemodynamically stable, we may consider ordering a CT scan. This can help us localise the source of the bleeding and identify any collections so we can make an informed decision on whether we need to take that patient back to theatre or not. In patients who are not hemodynamically stable, they need to go back to theatre. We need to ensure that these patients have effective hemostasis and therefore we need to contact emergency theatre and potentially liaise with ITU if they are very unstable. A surgical wound infection is an infection that occurs after the surgery in the wound through which the surgery took place. It is usually due to infiltration of bacteria from the patient's own flora 
So from the skin, it could be Staphylococcus aureus. From the bowel, it may be E. coli. And these patients often complain of pain at the site. They may be pyrexial and they may experience discharge from the wound. When we look at the wound, we notice that there is surrounding erythema. It's tender on palpation. It's warm. There may be surrounding edematous swelling. And there may be, of course, the discharge from the wound. Investigating, we want to make sure that we've got up-to-date full blood count, UNEs and inflammatory markers, although white cell count and CRP aren't particularly reliable, as these are likely to be raised postoperatively anyway. Blood cultures are also indicated if patients are pyrexial and there are signs of sepsis. We want to send samples for cultures and ideally we want to send pus in a universal container for microscopy, culture and sensitivity. Failing that, we can send a wound swab. Management-wise, we want to give antibiotics and we want to direct that to the likely source of the infection. And we want to rationalise it as soon as possible once we have our culture results. If our patient demonstrates signs of shock, of course, we want to fluid resuscitate them. And sometimes we may wish to remove superficial staples or sutures from the wound, which will aid in the evacuation of subdermal collections. Wound dehiscence is when a surgical wound breaks down, exposing underlying structures. Most commonly, this is occurring secondary to infection. And there are increased risk factors amongst those who are obese or malnourished, lifelong smokers, long-term steroid use, and those who are immunosuppressed. When we examine our patient, we observe the features of failed wound opposition, there may be underlying structures visible such as fat, fascia or muscle and in more extreme cases we may see exposed abdominal or other viscera. How can we manage these patients? Well, if they've got exposed abdominal viscera we want to cover it with saline soaked dressings to stop it drying out and we want to contact emergency theatres and try and get them back to theatre to close the wound as soon as possible. For those with partial thickness wound dehiscence we can sometimes manage them conservatively. We want to give antibiotics if there are any signs of infection and we want to pack the wound with appropriate dressings. These patients may have much more significant scarring at their surgical site which may require revision at a later date. Okay, An anastomotic leak is the failure of an anastomosis between two hollow organs. This can allow for the intraluminal fluid to escape into the surrounding tissues. It usually presents five to seven days postoperatively, and there are higher risk patients, including those who are malnourished, immunosuppressed and on long term steroid use, those who've had poor bowel prep for their initial procedure, those with a history of malignancy, and of course, there is a higher risk with a poor surgical technique. Patients with anastomotic leaks can present in one of three ways. They may present with a peritonitic picture, with a generalised abdominal pain and a rigid abdomen on examination. Patients will often require an emergency laparotomy, so emergency theatres need to be contacted immediately. They may present with an enteric fistula where the intraluminal contents can drain into the wounds or other organs, for example the bladder. And in these patients, fistulograms or CT abdomen can be useful for surgical planning. Some patients may form a localised collection in the form of an abscess. They often complain of pyrexia and sometimes demonstrate a systemic inflammatory response. They are usually locally tender at the site and CT abdomen again is very useful investigation and may be able to indicate whether the abscess is amenable to percutaneous radiologically guided drainage. How do we manage these patients in the acute phase? We want to make sure that they've got up-to-date blood tests. We want to resuscitate them with intravenous fluids if there is any evidence of systemic inflammatory response. IV antibiotics need to be given. They need to be broad spectrum and have good anaerobic cover. For example, we could give tazacin or kefiroxima metronidazole. 
Surgical management may be in the form of defunctioning the bowel and bringing up a stoma, or even repairing the anastomosis if possible. In patients with localised collections, they may be amenable to percutaneous drainage. Our final topic in this lecture is going to cover postoperative pyrexia. This is a very common complication postoperatively, and there are many different causes. It is defined as a body temperature above the normal range, typically 38 degrees Celsius, and patients often present postoperatively with rigors, sweats, and fever. The cause, as we've mentioned, depends on the time from the operation. One to two days postoperatively, patients develop atelectasis because they've been ventilated and they may not fully ventilate their lungs because of abdominal pain. There may be evidence of pneumonia or aspiration on chest x-ray, or it may even just be a response to the localised trauma experienced during the operation, leading to a systemic inflammatory response. Three to five days following the operation, patients sometimes develop urinary tract infections, which may be due to iatrogenic catheterization. Four to six days we start developing symptoms of DVT such as calf swelling, tenderness, edema and engorgement of superficial veins. Patients may complain of chest pain and shortness of breath if they've developed a pulmonary embolus. Five to seven days is the time that we start seeing symptoms consistent with surgical wound infections or anastomotic leaks. As with any patient who develops signs of pyrexia or a systemic inflammatory response, we want to make sure we've sent some up-to-date bloods. We want to perform a full septic screen, performing a chest x-ray, checking the urine, sending some wound swabs or pus, and sending some up-to-date blood cultures. In certain cases, it may be worthwhile considering further investigations, such as CTs of the abdomen, or a CTPA if we're considering that the patient may have developed a pulmonary embolus. And of course you want to manage the patient as per the symptoms and as per the likely cause. I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture and if so please let me know in the comments section below. If you wish to see more of our lectures please subscribe and visit our playlist section within our channel. I hope this lecture has aided you in your revision for your upcoming exams and I wish you the best of luck.